Hello everyone, my name is Shonuk and in this video we'll be discussing energy. So we'll start with a brief review of some general concepts and useful equations and then move on to some practice problems. So the first question you might ask is, well, what even is energy? So formally, energy is defined as a capacity to do work, which is basically the content of the work kinetic energy theorem, uh, W equals delta K, uh, where W is the work and K is the kinetic energy or the energy associated with motion of the particle. Uh, as an equation, work is equivalent to the dot product between force and displacement, or the integral of a force dotted with an infinitesimal displacement, and roughly characterizes how effectively the force you're applying to an object is influencing its motion. If the force is always perpendicular to the object's path, uh, as in this case, uh, you can see that the dot product is going to be zero, um, and that's because the force you're applying isn't really helping the particle move uh, faster along its path. Um, in contrast, if your force is perfectly aligned with the displacement vector of the particle, um, then you would end up doing positive work on it since you're helping the particle move faster. Uh, and you can imagine that if your force was in the opposite direction of the particle's trajectory, that would be negative work. So uh, energy is measured in units of joules in the SI system, and one joule is one Newton times one meter, which you can kind of see from the uh, work equation, force times the distance. Uh, additionally, if you convert Newtons to kilograms, meters, and seconds, uh, you'll end up with one joule is one kilogram times meters per second squared. All right, so with that intuition in mind, we can begin classifying sources of energy to better understand them. We call energy associated with an object's motion, kinetic energy, and typically symbolize it with K as we've already seen in the work kinetic energy theorem. Uh, the energy associated with an object's position or a configuration is called potential energy, uh, and it's typically symbolized with U. Some sources of potential energy can include batteries and circuits, which represent stored chemical energy, uh, springs, which store energy in their stretched or compressed states, since you can think of it like they want to return to their equilibrium state, and also just gravity, which is almost like a spring in that it stores energy in the separation of things that would normally uh, want to move together uh, towards each other, so to speak. So here are some expressions for the most common types of energy you'll see. Um, first, we have uh, the kinetic energy due to translation of an object's center of mass, uh, which is just given by one half times the mass of the object times the velocity of the object squared. Next, there's also kinetic energy due to the rotation of an object. So even if an object's center of mass is not moving, if it's spinning around its center of mass, then it'll have some kinetic energy due to that. Uh, and the kinetic energy due to rotation is given by one half I omega squared, where I is the moment of inertia of the object around the rotation axis, and omega is the uh, angular velocity. Next for potential energy, uh, the most common uh, potential energy term you'll see is the potential energy due to gravity. Um, in particular in a uniform gravitational field, which is a good approximation of the Earth uh, on the Earth's surface. Uh, and that's given by the mass of the particle times the factor G, uh, which is acceleration due to gravity, 9.81 meters per second squared, um, and H, which is kind of the height of the particle above some reference zero point. Uh, next, you'll often see the potential energy of a spring as we were describing earlier, and according to Hooke's law, that's given by one half k x squared, where k is the spring constant and x is the deviation from uh, the equilibrium length of the spring. So energy is mostly useful uh, because it's conserved. Uh, so the reason we care about energy is because conservation of energy often allows us to solve problems that we're unable to solve or would be very challenging to solve just using forces and Newton's laws. For example, um, a block sliding on a surface with friction would lose kinetic energy as it slows down. Um, but over time, that uh, kinetic energy is transferred to a surface as heat. Um, and uh, the energy is still present in the system uh, as an increased temperature of the surface. Uh, in certain special cases, mechanical energy, which is the sum of the kinetic and potential energies um, of an object, is itself conserved. Um, and for example, that would be the case if the block was sliding on a frictionless surface, since there wouldn't be any non-conservative or dissipative forces that would remove energy from the system. In these cases, for any two points in time, time one and time two, we know that the uh, total energy, total kinetic plus potential energy must be the same in each case. So uh, K1 plus U1 equals K2 plus U2. Uh, 
Um, then rearranging this equation slightly, subtracting k1 uh, from one side and u1 from the other, uh, and u2 from the other, we can see that uh, k2 minus k1 is negative u2 minus u1. Uh, so the change in kinetic energy overall uh, comes from an opposite change in potential energy. Uh, you can kind of see this by adding it to both sides, um, that this is the same thing as just the change in kinetic plus potential energy is zero. So mechanical energy is conserved. Um, with these basic concepts in hand, we can now check out a couple of example problems. So a classic example of the conservation of energy is in the ballistic pendulum. So the goal of this setup is to determine the velocity of a projectile given its mass by shooting it at a pendulum and studying that pendulum's motion. So the setup is as follows. We have this uh, little projectile particle of mass little m moving at a velocity of v, which is what we want to find in the end. Um, and it's going to hit a, a pendulum of uh, mass capital M uh, and length, uh, length cursive L. So as it hits the pendulum, um, it'll uh, stick to the pendulum. Um, so we have a total mass of this new object after the collision of uh, little m plus big M. Uh, and the pendulum will feel the impact, so it'll move upward a little bit, rotating around its pivot point uh, by some angle theta. So um, some additional variables that we'll want to define for solving this problem are u, which is going to be the velocity of that uh, object um, that like forms after the projectile collides with the bob, uh, and also the height that that pendulum rises to, um, since that's how we're going to use the gravitational potential energy. Using some simple trigonometry, uh, you can see that uh, the change in height is given by L minus L cosine theta. Um, and another way of writing that is factoring out a common factor of L to get L times one minus cosine theta. All right, so uh, with all these variables set up, we can actually start solving the problem. Um, and uh, the first step is to use conservation of momentum uh, to describe that initial collision. So conservation of momentum tells us that uh, the initial momentum, which is just little m times v, is going to be the same thing as the final momentum, uh, which we already know is given by the final mass, which is uh, the sum of the bob plus the projectile, uh, times the final velocity of that object, which is going to be uh, what we are calling u. All right, um, so the reason we wrote this expression is because it gives us an expression for v in terms of u. So v is going to be the sum of masses uh, divided by the projectile mass, just times uh, the final momentum u. All right, um, so uh, the reason we introduced u into this problem is because we want to use u um, in the conservation of energy setup. So uh, at, right after the collision, the energy of the bob time plus uh, projectile combined is just kinetic energy. So it'd be one half times the mass of that object, which is uh, the sum of the two individual masses, times the velocity squared. And we know the velocity is going to be u, so it'd be uh, 1 half m plus m times u squared. Additionally, this is all going to be equal um, to the maximum potential energy it reaches. Uh, and at that turning point, at that maximum uh, angle, the velocity is instantaneously zero, so all the energy is potential. Uh, and we end up with just uh, the potential energy due to gravity of uh, the total mass times g times h, uh, which we know is m plus m g l times one minus cosine of theta. All right, so we're getting there. Um, now we can notice that we can cancel these factors of total mass from both sides of the equation. Uh, and what that leaves us with is rearranging slightly, u squared equals two g l times one minus cosine theta. Uh, so now we're basically done. Uh, we can just combine these two expressions that we found. Um, and we'll see that V is going to be M plus M uh, over little m times uh, U. And U was the square root of two GL times one minus cosine theta. Yeah, so with that, we're done. Uh, given the mass of the projectile and you know the configuration of our pendulum, uh, capital M and uh, cursive L, we can determine the velocity of the projectile that was launched at it.
So uh, one thing I want to emphasize is uh, a common mistake that you could make while solving this problem. Um, so it'd be incorrect uh, to say that the initial kinetic energy, one half little mv squared, is equal to the final potential energy, which uh, we talked about was uh, the sum of masses times g times h. Um, the reason that this is incorrect is because the collision was inelastic um, between the projectile and the bob. So what that means is, uh, you know, for our purposes, the mass is stuck together, which uh, is why we have all of these m plus m's uh, floating around. Uh, but uh, it also means that as the objects collided, um, the objects may have heated up uh, or dissipated energy as shock waves. So energy is not conserved in that initial collision. That's why in our conservation of energy statement, we use the velocity u, which had to do with the kinetic energy after the collision, because after the collision, there's no more opportunities for energy to be dissipated uh, or lost as heat or shock waves or anything. All right, so uh, in this problem, we looked at a conversion of initial kinetic energy of the projectile to gravitational potential energy of the pendulum, but we can also consider setups involving a conversion between just different forms of potential energy, like jumping on a trampoline. So uh, here's the situation. We're starting off in free fall from some height h, uh, and we have mass m, um, and then eventually, as we land on the trampoline, the trampoline is going to flex by some amount, uh, which we're going to call x. Uh, and that's ultimately what we're trying to solve for, is how far the trampoline kind of sags under our weight um, at maximum. Um, so to do this, uh, we'll assign some sort of springiness to the trampoline, uh, and we'll encapsulate that in the spring constant k. Um, and uh, note that in the beginning situation and also the final situation, we're not moving. We're starting from rest at the top of our highest jump, uh, and we're ending at rest um, right before the trampoline is going to accelerate us back to speed. So in both of these cases, the potential, the kinetic energy is actually zero. Uh, so all we have to focus on is the potential energy in each situation. Um, in this first situation, uh, calling the reference point of gravitational potential energy um, the like same as the zero point of the trampoline um, in terms of its uh, stretching and uh, compression, stretching and compressing, um, we can see that the gravitational potential energy is just going to be mgh. Um, and the trampoline is unflexed right now. So there is no uh, elastic potential energy from the springiness of the trampoline. So that would just be uh, adding zero. In contrast, on the other side, uh, we're below the zero point of our gravitational potential energy by some amount. So uh, we have a potential energy of minus mgx so we're under that. Um, and the trampoline has flexed a little bit. So we do have some potential energy, one half kx squared uh, from the trampoline. So uh, at this point, we're essentially done with all of the physics. Um, and we can just uh, do some rearranging to interpret our results. So uh, rearranging this equation uh, gives a quadratic equation in x. So uh, we'll get x squared equals uh, minus 2mg, or x squared minus 2mg over k uh, x minus 2 mgh uh, over k equals zero. Um, so now using the quadratic formula, we'll see that x equals 2 mg over k plus or minus the square root of 4 m squared g squared over k squared uh, plus 8 mgh all over k. Uh, and this whole thing is divided by two. So in principle, I guess we could just box this answer uh, and call it a day. But uh, to gain some more insight, we can simplify this uh, and think more about uh, some of the other physics that's happening here. So uh, first, just dividing by two, uh, we'll get that x is going to be mg over k plus or minus the square root of m squared g squared over k squared plus uh, 2mgh uh, all uh, over k. And additionally, we can look at this inside of the square root and factor out an mg over k uh, from that as well um, to find x equals mg over k plus or minus mg over k outside the square root times uh, the square root of 1 plus uh, 2kh over mg. Um, all right, so at this point, we can see that um, 
the inside of the square root is going to be greater than one. Uh, so its value is going to be greater than one. And we want X to be positive. So uh, we're only gonna take the positive root of this situation. So uh, we'll get that X is MG over K, uh, doing some more factoring, one plus the square root of one plus two KH all over MG. All right, so uh, this formula uh, can help us interpret the situation a little bit more um, because now we can think about, for example, the force that we're experiencing at that time. So the upward force of the trampoline, uh, again, by Hooke's law is just given by KX. Uh, so uh, we can see that the force is given just by MG uh, multiplying by K on both sides times one plus square root of one plus two KH all over MG itself. Um, so this is good. Uh, we see that this upwards force is greater than MG, um, basically just by this factor over here. Um, and that's really good because uh, we want to actually bounce on the trampoline. So we need the upward force to be greater than the force of gravity in order for that to happen. So uh, the situation makes sense. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, we can actually calculate the acceleration that we're experiencing at this point if we wanted to. Uh, all without ever having to use Newton's laws, which you can imagine would have been kind of complicated at this point uh, due to having like the spring force combined with gravitational force um, and then trying to find that maximum displacement. Okay, so we've done a lot. Um, so let's recap. Um, so energy represents the capacity to do work, uh, which is described in the work kinetic energy theorem and can come in a variety of forms, including kinetic and potential energy. Um, kinetic energy is associated with motion, while potential energy is associated with position. Um, energy is most useful when it's conserved, in which case we can uh, know that changes in one form of energy, uh, whether it be kinetic or potential, uh, must be accounted for in changes of other forms of energy. Um, so we have uh, expressions that look like delta K is supposed to be negative of delta U. Um, and these allow us to solve lots of problems that would be really hard to get through using just forces. So uh, I hope this helps you understand some of the physics better uh, and thank you for watching.